Costello and I have the pleasure tonight of introducing our speaker, Nori W. Winter. I had the pleasure to teach a, a summer workshop with Nori down in Charlotte for the American Planning Association in the summer of 93 along with a Ball State alum by the name of Bruce Race. And it didn't take me long to realize that Nori is one of those unique architect and urban designers and historic preservationists that see historic preservation as a very vital component, a very vital vehicle for helping with both downtown revitalization and neighborhood revitalization. Um, and I think also is very, very much a national figure in the ability of using design guidelines as a means to, in a sense, achieve some of these. Nori uh, is from Boulder, Colorado, and uh, flew in here bringing the nice and warm weather with him today. Holds a bachelor's degree from a bachelor's degree from a Tulane University and has a master's in architecture and urban design from UCLA. His company uh, specializes in uh, communities that really are known for their special amenities or their siting in very very unique landscapes and obviously also very rich in historic resources. And he has worked literally with dozens of communities across this country and now in Canada, so now I have to say it's an international practice, uh, in assisting communities in a wide range of activities based around historic resource planning and preservation, whether that be based in a, a tourist community or whether that be with a, uh, a neighborhood group. This company has also provided design review training for a host of cities such as Boston, Indianapolis, Louisville, and Nashville. And uh, in this regard, he is truly one of the national helping communities to assume a leadership role in using design review as a means of obtaining quality within our environments. He's also conducted statewide preservation commission training for Georgia, Iowa, Kentucky, New Hampshire, and New Jersey, among others. And I'm proud to say that tomorrow, the Muncie Historic Preservation and Rehabilitation Commission will be the host commission for about 85 commission members and other fans of historic preservation and Rory will conduct a one-day workshop in how to develop a more effective historic preservation commission. So this trip here to Indiana is in a sense of a function here at the college and then tomorrow. I'm very, very proud in fact that again Muncie will be hosting that. He's also developed design guidelines for Austin and Denver and Salt Lake City and he has recently assisted the city of Atlanta in developing new preservation standards. He's a frequent speaker. In fact, he just related a dinner that he delivered one of the Cornelius O'Brien lectures in the past here in Indiana, very prestigious invited uh, speaking engagement, uh, and he has been a frequent speaker for the National Park Service, the APA, uh, and he serves as the chairman of the board of directors of the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. So on behalf of the College of Architecture and Planning, Maury, welcome. So 
certainly an interest in historic preservation, but also an interest in community development, in livability, in managing neighborhoods, in helping to shape the destiny of the places that we live. And in that respect, I think it also represents the church of other community planning goals along with historic preservation. And that's somewhat what I'm going to talk about tonight, I think, is, is how preservation as, uh, as converters with other planning tools, and particularly to talk about some of the design issues and methods for providing design guidelines for communities across the country. Tony mentioned I've had the fortune of being able to work with a lot of communities as a consultant, helping them to write design guidelines for historic districts or to develop an urban design plan for a neighborhood or a downtown. Some years ago, I had a great pleasure in doing the downtown plan for Greencastle on the Pioneer Road. It was one of the first Main Street towns here in Indiana. I actually grew up the Main Street Award for the project here. And I had a really uh, wonderful experience with a, a committee group of people there who were very much concerned about the future of their downtown, not only because it meant something to them economically, but also because it meant something to them in terms of the place where they live, and the place, as I recall, they were particularly concerned that they wanted to have a community in which their children <coughs> would want to stay. In the future, certainly, but they also would have a sense of connection. And I think we're seeing that across the country. In many of the communities I've worked, uh, they've been special. They have been uh, resort communities or small towns with a very special character where the citizens are extremely committed about their future. They participate actively in helping to shape its future. And in those communities, urban design and historic preservation are not passive activities, they're not spectator sports. They're things that uh, people get actively involved in. So the methodology that we've developed, that we've had to develop, I suppose, is one that involves the community helping to make those policy decisions, and then in helping to maintain the system that, uh, that promotes preservation. <clears throat> what I want to talk about is a, a very pragmatic, realistic view of historic preservation at a local level, where the battles are really fought in the trenches, where most historic properties are protected. We know today that there are more than one million historic properties under local community jurisdictions across the United States. That is more than is listed on the National Register. It's more than any federal program will touch. And, I, and any sort of regulatory review process, it's more than any, any program will touch in any grant program. These are resources that are protected under local ordinances that provide for some form of community comment or review before alterations are made to those properties. That's a significant number of properties, and it's a significant movement. That's sort of the one that's facing challenges today, in terms of those who question whether or not the community at large has the right to in any way regulate or limit the way in which one uses their property. But I think it's also a movement that is extremely strong from the perspective that I have, being able to work across the country, and then wearing my hat as chairman of the alliance. I can tell you that we are seeing every day against all odds more historic districts being designated across the nation. We're seeing more communities willing to enter into the federal certified local government program in spite of the resources, the staff, uh, resistance to property regulation. For some reason out there, people have a very strong belief that preservation, that local preservation, local preservation ordinances is something that's important to them. Um, because my viewpoint is pragmatic, I'm sometimes accused of not being a purist in regards to preservation. And uh, I suppose I wear that badge gladly. Uh, I believe that preservation is one of the tools in our arsenal of community development and management. I have to explain that my degrees are in architecture, not in historic preservation. I learned it the hard way. Uh, at work, and I, my first real job was working for a community development agency in Watts in 1972. And we were adapting to reuse the only buildings we were on, the only we were going to see in Watts, not because they were historic, but because
because no one else was going to be nuts enough to build anything. We were adapting tilt-up concrete T-slab warehouses into everything that we could imagine. What I learned was you make the best use of the resources you have. You don't undo that that doesn't need undoing. You fix that, only that that's damaged beyond repair. And you replace only that that's beyond repair. Now, I didn't know it, but I was learning the fundamentals of historic preservation. And that's really it. If a building is intact, preserve it. If it's deteriorated, repair it. If it's deteriorated or portions are deteriorated beyond repair, replace those to match the current supply and kind of that approach. And that's it. That's the basic philosophy for the treatment of a historic building. Now things get a little bit more complicated though when you throw buildings in the context of a historic district. Our preservation theory really involved addressing the treatment of individual buildings. And we extrapolated to the treatment of historic districts. Well, historic districts are not the same. Typically, a building is of a single time. It may be that it has alterations and additions that have also taken on the historic significance. But they speak of their own era as well. Some districts speak of a single time. Others are as eclectic as you can imagine, have buildings that date from a wide spectrum of our nation's history that are simply untidy from the standpoint of the preservationist approach. Those are the ones that get fun, though, and that I want to talk to you about a little bit tonight. Uh, let's see. I need to go into the media format here. And I've got two options. Which one is it you suppose I use? I bet it's this one. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, that's the commercial. I mean, that was supposed to already be on suit. This would be imprinted in your minds. <laughs> Number one, your company, uh, whenever you wake with a smile on your face this morning. Um, we're a small company. Actually, for several years, I was a partner in a regular architecture firm in Boulder, uh, but uh, headed up our preservation and design division. And then finally, I realized that uh, um, that was a difficult way to go. And the things that I wanted to do, I needed to have more flexibility to do. I set up my own company about 12 years ago, and I now have eight people who work with me. For those of you who are interested in careers, may have a University of Backgrounds. One has a master's in historic preservation from the University of Georgia with a bachelor's in history. Uh, two have uh, degrees in architecture. And another has a degree in landscape architecture with a specialty in historic landscapes. Uh, so we're kind of a motley crew. And we patch together disciplines as we need them. And of course, like all small firms, we rely extensively on outside consultants. We team up a lot. Uh, we have other professionals to help us get our get our job done. Uh, and while I'm going to talk about design review systems and design guidelines, I just want to let you know that we uh, do uh, get involved in other kinds of projects, but uh, not really get into those uh, But when you stay on some streets, uh, you get a sense of time and place. And that, of course, is the thing that distinguishes the district from individual, a collection of individual resources. Individual buildings, are significant because they may be associated with significant events or persons, or represent distinct design or life ways or craftsmanship. Districts do also, but they also can bring with them a sense of design uh, that establishes a sense of time and place. This is the Dino Ohio, actually. And if we were to stand on this street at the turn of the century, we would have recognized, I don't know, what, three different architectural styles. It isn't that these buildings are all built in the same style but that they had a certain fundamental understanding of how buildings were to be built at that time. They were the traditional commercial uh, storefront seen in North America for 200 years, and that was the first floor was primarily transparent, the upper floor was mostly solid with smaller vertically proportioned openings puncture into the wall, capped off with a cornice and molding at the top. And the rhythm of upper story windows distributed across this wall, the building solves to tie them together. The way moldings and sills and windows align helps to create a sense of vision continuity as well. Now, you don't stand on the street and say, oh my god, look at that continuity. Uh, by any means. But I do think that subconsciously we do respond favorably to these places and we say they have a sense of place. 
it's important to realize while we're talking about district, though, that there are historic resources and then there are historic resources. Some are those individual landmarks, like the Captain Favell House in Astoria, Washington. It is a very special building. It's uh, a, one of the finer examples of craftsmanship in the Northwest. It's a combination of a variety of styles with a lot of Italianate meanings to it. And regardless of its setting, whether it was on an open plain or in the midst of a 1960s suburb, we would all agree this is a historic structure. While a complementary context is nice to have, it's not essential for us to consider this to be a historic building by any means. Other buildings are simpler and more modest. They're vernacular cottages, this one in Salt Lake City, but it could be anywhere in USA. And this building relies a lot for its significance on its context and the fact that it's in a row of these buildings. If it were sitting out in the cornfield by itself, we might not land market. Or if it were in the midst of a 60s suburb, we might question its significance. Even though we would recognize it as being a nice building, whether or not it would meet our criteria for the landmark would be a question. There are certainly rows of commercial buildings, such as these in Guthrie, Oklahoma, that are an extraordinary collection. And even though they may not be individual landmark structures, as a combination, they become one of the most important commercial main streets I think we have in the country because of the degree of integrity that the buildings have. Similarly, this row in Telluride, Colorado, speaks of a special time, the mining era, that had impacts on fortunes made across the country, and therefore has a significance that transcends the design. There are some districts where the goal for preservation is extremely pure and rigid. This is St. Charles, Missouri, one of the earliest federal period cities west of the Mississippi, of course, it's just a few yards west of the Mississippi. But in any case, uh, it's quite an accomplishment, one of the early French towns. And in fact, it's where the Lewis and Clark Expedition set out. The commission here has rigorously preserved this city, this district, and has required that new construction exactly match the historic styles of the district. Most communities don't take this part of the line preservation of their historic districts. And in fact, the city council, thinking that the commission here has gotten out of line, has asked us to come in and look at some of the other policies. Um, although it's hard to argue that the results here are spectacular. But it does raise the question of the concept of integrity. Not my personal integrity, although that does come in question along the way sometimes, but that of the buildings. It's important to separate the concept of integrity from that of significance. This building is in downtown Washington, Missouri Historic District, which is a charming Missouri River town, and it is an important Main Street town there. They incidentally have adopted guidelines for voluntary use. It's not a regulatory system, although they do have a local commission, but they don't have any time to be found. And this building is actually owned by the chair of the commission. Now, uh, the thing is, even though this building has been altered and compromised, I think we all would say it's still an historic structure worth restoring, worth saving. And therefore, it still retains enough of that integrity, enough of the, those elements of design and building fabric that make it a historic property. Others uh, may have been concealed under aluminum siding, and you can see the difficulty of jumping when you apply aluminum siding to a turret. It vertically, this is in Cambridge. But um, I think again, we also recognize this is one of those jewels waiting, waiting to be opened at this tin can. Although its integrity is compromised, we suspect that the substance, it's the majority of the historic building fabric is intact, and that the building still is going to retain its integrity. By contrast, this building in Salt Lake has gone over that line, and no longer is a member of the cloth. This is clearly a building that. While it may be old, no longer retains its integrity. While it may date from a period of significance for this historic district, it no longer contributes to that district 
as a historic structure. It's beyond recovery and it would not show up in survey. The same thing can be true said of some of the facade experiments that Boston had a few years ago, such as this. Now, from an urban design standpoint, preserving a facade like this may still make an interesting streetscape. And we need to distinguish that. We may have still maintained a wonderful sidewalk experience, but it ain't preservation of the historic property. The question of the question about the degree of integrity and sensitivity of an individual historic district really comes to the fore when you start considering new construction and what its character should be. This is a new structure in the South Street Seaport District in Manhattan. Many communities have responded in a variety of ways to the challenges of how you manage and protect historic districts. There are some, such as Washington, Missouri, that I mentioned, that have what I would call an advocacy program. They publish design guidelines as an informational tool and distribute them for voluntary use. There's no formal review whatsoever of anything that a property owner might seek to do. There are others, the downtown Boulder is an example, that have what I would call an advisory program. These are ones in which community asks that they have a conversation with you, but you then are free to go on and do as you please. The downtown Boulder example, if you are altering or constructing a new building in the downtown area with a construction value exceeding $10,000, then you are required to come before the Downtown Design Advisory Board and hear their comments to your proposed project. And they must check a line on the building permit to show that you've been in for that discussion before you can get your building permit. But you can go on and do what you like. What they've found in those cases are that projects that tended to be oriented in the appropriate direction welcomed advice and criticism and tended to get better. Those that were already headed in an inappropriate direction tended to stay that way. That, of course, is the fact of life of the advisory review process. There are others that are incentive programs. And many communities have these in which a carrot is offered for the step. No interest loan program, facade grant program, a technical assistance program are examples of the kinds of incentives that are used to get people in the door. And so they voluntarily enter into the system, but then compliance is mandatory. You must follow the guidelines and standards in order to receive the public benefit that's being offered. And certainly, the federal income tax program for the certified rehabilitation of historic properties is an example of an incentive program. And then finally, there are the regulatory programs. That's the, those are the kinds that perhaps we're most familiar with. Um, that's the conventional local landmarks board with an ordinance that requires that you must come in for review and you must get the board's approval before you can receive the building permit. It's important to recognize when you are enforcing design review, and particularly for any other systems too, that the guidelines you develop need to be clearly and firmly based on a good analysis of the context. All too often, I think we're seeing design policies and guidelines that don't reflect the architecture of the community. They're too abstract for the layman, for the property owner to understand. And that's sort of the criticism I have of the Secretary of the Interior standards for the rehabilitation of historic buildings. They are written for people who are in the profession to understand the principles that are being put forth in them. And it's difficult for a lay person, particularly, to be able to predict what the outcome would be if those standards are articulated in a clear way. So these are some of the factors that we will look at as we analyze the character of districts to define what their character is as a means of establishing the foundation of the guidelines. In a downtown area with traditional storefronts, it might be a series of variables such as these. The materials of the facade itself. Is it a masonry facade, brick wall, stone, etc.? The display window, that traditional large floor glass element. The recessed entry is a typical element. Kick plates at the bottom of the storefront or other examples. And uh, molding at the top and perhaps a sign band above the storefront itself. You can dress this up in Art Deco or Italianate, but it's still the same fundamental American storefront. When you're talking about district guidelines, it's important to understand. What we've found is that 
you need to involve the community in developing those guidelines. And in order to involve them, you've got to adopt some very simple terms that they can feel comfortable using in describing your district. And then what we've found is you really need to analyze the district in three senses. You need to look at its historic character, you need to look at its present character, and you need to do a little bit of future forecasting. What might the district become under current trends, current regulations, and current market conditions if you don't intervene with any design guide, guidelines or other regulatory processes? And it's by comparing those three tenses that you will begin to actually develop a policy about the district. So first we begin by looking at the historic character and certainly historical research, including photographs, which is a great uh, place to start. We did the streets of Yander, did we follow the topography as we did here in Central City Hall? Did they use those traditional building components that we looked at, for example, in the historic? And how did they come together as a group? This is an example in Loveland, Colorado, their main street, how that traditional storefront added up along the, along the road. Again, there were a variety of styles seen here, and style wasn't the important issue. It was the fact that they all combined to create that sense of continuity because by and large, most storefronts were built at the same height. And moldings tend to align, now, not in a lockjaw, rigid manner. It's not that every storefront was built to nine foot six inches, but that within a certain range, you would see the moldings in the storefront. That begins to give you a cue, if you're going to write guidelines for new construction, about one of the fundamental characteristics, if this is still the character that exists on the street. So sometimes you want to compare sort of the current with the historic, the current scene and the historic scene, pretty much intact, pretty much the same. Our policies are going to be pretty much preserved intact. Keep the character of the streets as it is. Around the corner of that same street, the historic character has changed dramatically. Our goals here are going to be obviously different. Our expectations for the character as part of the district obviously are going to be different. And only by comparing the past and the present can we really begin to understand that. Certainly, as a part of the historic inventory, a good listing of the styles found in the district is essential. In this case, this is, these are examples of residential structures in the neighborhood of Dallas, Texas. I'll show you some more about Dallas in a minute. Some simple sketches with simple notes, with simple terminologies, <coughs> lay people see for the first time the elements that they have in their buildings that they may not have recognized. You can begin to diagram those relationships. That horizontal line that we were looking at commercial storefronts is certainly an easy one to identify a lot of them such as back here in Guthrie, Oklahoma, again, where buildings are built in such a uniform that there's a very strong sense of I mean, like lateness on the block. And there basically were sort of two variations of the storefront here, the flat arched window and the half arched window. And they sort of alternate back and forth, adding a little bit of variety, and yet there's a very strong rhythm to the upper story windows that contributes to the continuity. But, that same principle gets modified in Park City, Utah. The topography causes, causes a stair step effect. In fact, <coughs> if you were to build a new building in this context and try to align the cornices, it'd be wrong. So sometimes what is not similar can be just as important as what is And here's the way that relationship is diagrammed from the street. A simple little sketch in the book that helps the doctors from LA who are planning on investing in Park City understand the context of the building. In fact, what we found in Park City was because the town is built in such a steep valley, the guidelines for roofs, the most important design variable that we were going to deal with, the shape, the texture, the color, the materials of roofs, because you look down on them, was going to be very important. Now, in most districts, that's much less of a factor than some of the other design variables you deal with. So again, that context is what was defining the difference there. In Charleston, while most roads align, Houses along the battery were turned for the view, and they're at a 45 degree angle to the street, to the property line. That creates a sawtooth in the plan that becomes one of the important character defining features of that neighborhood. More conventional residential neighborhoods typically had uniform setbacks, and that begins to create a bit of a character to the street as well. Many of us recognize turn of the century neighborhoods like this. 
the row of street trees and a line down the, down the street, sidewalks separated from the curb, walkways that are perpendicular to the sidewalk leading to the entry of the building. Typically, the entries are raised somewhat. There are steps along the way or a portion of the building that defines the entryway. And again, regardless of the style, those are elements that define many of our residential neighborhoods. Sometimes the trees hide a lot of sense. They're one of the greatest elements of continuity in many of the districts. And obviously, the loss of trees becomes a critical issue in some of these cases. Looking for the repetition of similarly shaped and sized elements, uniformly spaced in a building or in a block, can also be an important character defining feature in many districts. The pattern of this row of houses in Indianapolis, a building space, building space, is one of its important characteristics. And the modules to which these storefronts in Charleston were constructed also is important. Even when some buildings are of totally different scales, the banks that are afforded built at a, a colossal scale, uh, which is different from the rhythm of the storefronts of the commercial buildings, and yet they were built in the same width so that at least they fit in the building module along the street. You can diagram those same relationships, simple sketches, guaranteed. In North Adams, Massachusetts, that rhythm of upper story windows, the pattern that they create, links buildings that really vary in materials, heights, and styles across this entire block of building. You can then begin to create something, to criticize something like this entity storefront. Not only because it is obscuring the historic details of that building, but from an urban design standpoint, it's interrupting the rhythm of those every story windows along the block. But you can just imagine that it's got exactly the same relationship as the storefronts. Looking for similar size and shape elements also can sometimes be a rewarding part of the analysis of context. If you stood on this street, in Woodstock, Massachusetts at the turn of the century, you would recognize again three or four different architectural styles. So it's not the fact that they were the same style that gave them compatibility or sensitivity of compatibility. Certainly it's partially because of the line the sidewalk edge, but here there's a repetition of a triangular element that shows up the gables, the towers, the variety of forms along the way that contributes to the continuity of the street. In Austin, we summarized several of those relationships. And here they had two kinds of commercial storefronts, the Cloud Arch and the Arch Street as well. And that there was a range of building modules. It wasn't exactly the same for every building, but there was a range of then about 15 to 27 feet or so. And it gave us a clue that any new building built into that context needs to have a rhythm that expresses that module. Sometimes the street plan, the town plan, the neighborhood plan, the streetscape itself is an important character kind of feature. And this is a part to Biltmore Village in Asheville, North Carolina. Biltmore Village was designed uh, to house the employees who worked at the, at the Biltmore Mansion. It was planned by Frederick Mahomes and Richard Morris Hunt to the architecture. It's a prestigious little uh, lead line for a tiny little workers community. And sometimes the street plans themselves become important. In Middlebury, and Vermont, the cow paths that turned into roads are part of the character of the community. So that when someone begins to, oh, I'm just going to so when someone begins to erode the edge here, it not only makes this an unpleasant investment experience, but it impedes your ability to perceive the character of the meandering road system as part of the historic character. Sometimes a figure to ground study can also be revealed. One of the things we've discovered is that even within a historic district, there may be sub areas of character that need their own guidelines, which you can't necessarily treat everyone the same. And this is downtown Boulder. And in this case, what you're looking at is everything that is in the commercial zone district. But historically, the original downtown core was about half the size, and then areas that originally had been residential were rezoned for commercial use. And you can pick those areas out, can't you? It's very easy to see these small footprints on the periphery here that clearly were residential buildings that 
now it's not for commercial use. We'll also say that, that, that those buildings or the new building in those areas should match the commercial storefront, so obviously it's going to be inappropriate. So this is a quick way of discovering some of those sub areas of the area. Sometimes the street pattern itself is important. This is the plan of the Biltmore Village in Nashville. And Olmstead planned it so that it was, it was sort of the precursor to this event, I guess, in a way, because it was sort of a fantasy village, both a kind of quasi uh, Tudor, quasi French uh, village of architectural character. The streets were all laid out so that you couldn't see outside the village. There was always a, a, an end of the street blocking you, but you would see a building at the end of the street. You wouldn't see up to the real world except along the front of the major access roads. But you can see that for most of the streets, for example, the vista always ended with a building at the end of the street. And it's only these major arterials here that led you out of, out of the village. That's one of the important features of the, of the plan. As a part of the analysis of Biltmore Village, we discovered that in fact there were several sub areas, each with their own characteristics. Areas that had historically been commercial, areas that had large houses that had been converted to commercial uses, portions that had institutional buildings, and areas that had more of a strip commercial architectural character, each of which merited their own kinds of value. While the character analysis looks for the fabric, the background buildings, and those that weave everything together, there are, of course, always exceptions to the rule in accents, the civic buildings, etc., that don't necessarily follow that traditional pattern of development. And in any downtown area, you're going to have the equivalent. In any residential area, you're going to have the equivalent. The church, the courthouse, the city hall, the library, these are buildings that aren't traditional commercial storefronts, that aren't traditional houses, that don't follow the rules of setbacks and rhythm, etc. Now, when you look at that traditional housing in Galveston, it has some significant features that are in common with all the buildings there. And that is that they're all raised because of the climate and the water there. Each has a porch that faces the street. Now, some project from the building, some are cut in, some go the full width of the, of the architecture, others only go half of it, etc. But what's important is that each one has one, and they're all defined and identified by the steps. That's one of the important character defining features here. There's a relatively uniform setback. All roofs are sloping, if you're able, even though some are oriented parallel to the street, whether it's a perpendicular. And there's a, a uniform side yard setback. Add to that the secondary structures that define the rear yards and begin to establish the line of the alleyways along the backyard. And then add another layer of the landscape fences and the plantings and the street trees that had scale and defined yards. Now, with that understanding, you can begin to criticize this infill building. Now, obviously, we know that it's, it's, it's uh, pretty bad. It's a fourplex apartment building, and the entrance is all turned to the side. Now, from an objective standpoint, as a commission of code, you can't just stand up there and say it's in full taste. But we can now, given the analysis we've gone through, objectively criticize it because it doesn't respect those fundamental characteristics that we identified for this neighborhood. It doesn't respect the front yard. It doesn't have an entry oriented to the street, which less one is identified by uh, steps. It's missed all those fundamental features that make building in this neighborhood in Galveston. And similarly, down the street, I think this is an example of someone missing forest from the trees. These folks focused on matching the strap work on the buildings and missed some of the fundamentals here that roofs aren't flat in Galveston for practical reasons. And also just miss the, the, the uniform setback that they set aside. If they did get it, they're supposed to have porches. That's about all Now in terms of future forecasting, this was a little quick analysis done at Italia by Paul Wilder, which was experienced in a fair amount of growth. This historically was one of the blocks downtown. And uh, the main street side is here, on the front. The back side was residential with some warehouses, mixed bag of things, and smaller buildings stepping down to the interior block. Uh, Tony Wright went through a robust period, and during that time, the volunteer fire department for practice each year burned off a building in this block. So uh, by the time we did the study, there wasn't much left. Now, Tony Wright's market was heating up as a ski resort, and under the current zoning regulations at the time, this was a projection of what could happen on that block. And an example of what could happen if you just focused on matching the brackets and not making some 
this history of development. Uh, clearly, it was a totally different scale of building than the same tradition that would change the particular types of material blocks. Based on this analysis, the uh, community recognized that their zoning was not in jive with their preservation goals or their guideline objectives for the downtown area, and basically reduced the zoning in the area to make the buildings smaller. In a similar analysis in Breckenridge, which is a building up the town from the same similar period, 1870s and 1880s, and running up through the uh, first the end of the first world war. Traditionally, buildings, particularly in the residential area, were quite small. But the zoning allowed at the time something that was quite large. And this was an analysis of given the regulations at the time, what one could build in the historic district. As a, as a building, in this case, uh, this is four lots that you could assemble and you could build in a, a condo complex of this scale. Through a series of sketches, we illustrated how you might begin to break up that mass into forms that would be smaller in scale, or how you might combine them into two duplexes that would still be larger, but more in character with the form of the district. And finally showed that really to be compatible, while still allowing the buildings to be larger than they were historically, that they ultimately did need to downsize to actually be compatible with these buildings. Now, the mining towns were particularly difficult challenges because the original buildings were so small. The original houses here were 400 to 600 square feet in size. And that's very hard to make that a livable residence for very many people, particularly in this community area. People are seeking to build a 4,000 square foot home. So the downtown to say 2,000 square foot is the limit. It's quite an accomplishment um, in that kind of situation. These are other sketches showing the difference between transitioning gradually to transitioning greatly, what the effects could be. What it was demonstrated here to the community was that they needed to be certain that zoning regulations that were underlying the design review system were as much a part of their preservation policies as the guidelines themselves. Now quickly, just some examples of what some of the guidelines might look like. Ideally, they're illustrated. They can be funny and lively as a cartoon book. They can be more polished desktop publishing format. But it is important that they be pictured, graphic, obviously talking design, and understand what the questions are. And it's also important to be certain in many cases that people are helping with the document. When you think about a set of design guidelines, you think of any individual project you're going to do, you're only going to use maybe a third of the policies at any given time. If you're renovating a building, for example, you're not going to use the check on new construction, vice versa. So we developed some sort of visual table of content of tents and matrices such as this to help users through the book so they can find the fastest way uh, through the material. And finally, it's just important to recognize that the guidelines themselves are just a part of a whole policy kit that the community should have. If they don't exist in vacuum, that they should be established to provisions for design review, which are provided for in the zoning ordinance, which ideally, I mean, the preservation ordinance, which ideally is driven by a preservation plan, which is a component of an offensive plan. There should be a very clear relationship. Now, we need to quickly change the other reel. And did you? Yeah, just, uh, hey, just go ahead. It's ready to roll, is it? Yeah. Okay, how am I doing this time? Oh, I need to, oh, I see. I need to go to the other. There we go. Okay, now I wanted to show you real quickly a couple of communities where design review has been in effect now for about 15 years. So you can see the effects of managing change in the historic district. This is Old Town Fort Collins. Um, is Old Town that funny? I don't know. <laughs> um, and you can put this but the original, here's the river and the railroad, and the original Old Town was built parallel to the railroad where the depot was constructed. Later on, the main part of the town is built in the north-south direction, north east to the bottom of the picture here. But this is, of course, the old town. Built in the 1870s, uh, to about 1910, then went into a state of decline for several years. Oh. Um, 
it's like many main streets of, of the time. It's kind of a wonderful collection of small fronts, familiar with the art front, the details, etc. The Linden Hotel is sort of a focal point here. We'll see uh, this building, we'll see this building, among others. Uh, this will later on be known as Black's Glass. I'll tell you about this one, turn to a fur bar. Um, in fact, there it is. Uh, it, Old Town went through a period of decline. It was not the place to be. It's where the Winos were, etc. You all know the story. Uh, but in the late 70s and early 80s, people met again buying properties, individual entrepreneurs, and the restaurant or whatever, saw vision. And some of the buildings went through this sort of fern bar stage. They were kind of modest uh, restoration projects, not real preservation projects necessarily, but they kept the buildings alive and had to attract investment in the area. This building did go through another level of restoration. Here it is uh, later in its life, as Old Town really began to end up. Another building, one of these classic tin can houses that we love to all get our hands on. We just can't enjoy really something there. Uh, we feel pulled off, uh, most of the buildings intact, again, as well as it does retain its integrity, and here it is restored. Uh, so, what was going on here was, of course, the anti demolition provision of the ordinance didn't allow this building to be torn down, which was designed to keep provisions, required that the change to be a subject to review by the commission. Now, this is a project that we did. It was the old city hall and town hall. The original building was on the left side here with the tower, and the town hall was built on the right. And then uh, and some architects trained the Bauhaus helped it out in the 60s. Uh, and they even up the windows upstairs, upstairs which weren't symmetrical to begin with. And they had to widen the doors for the fire trucks. Of course, by this time, the town hall had to move down. Uh, finally, this even got to be too small for the fire department. They moved down. And the project and he pulled off all the metal, and this is what was left. Now, this one's really pretty marginal. It tries to integrate some of the on the say it's lost and we can tear it down. But this particular building owner saw potential here, and so we helped him restore it. Now, there's a lot of reconstruction here. Uh, and then and we had some fun with a couple of little subtleties. Since this had never been a storefront on this side, we set back a contemporary black metal storefront in the shadows so create the shade and effect that you would have with the large door of the old firehouse doors, rather than putting a fake Victorian storefront inside of the new attic. Here's this side of the This is all we built out of wood, whereas the original is metal. And we actually had to engineer this so that this is a separate structural system because it's sort of a cleaning effect of the tower. This was so successful that the businesses in here didn't have to advertise on the street address in the newspaper. They just said, we're in the old town firehouse. And it really became you know, leader in the area. Others began to invest, and this is an example of a building that has been altered, where reconstruction of this element is appropriate. And here is that building uh, as it was restored. Now, of course, in a lot of these cases, paint is, is helping off a lot. Known for paint schemes are obscuring a lot of the ornament detail. Right next door is this building, and it was fixed up, but this poultry shop didn't want to leave. And it demonstrates you don't have to be a chic boutique to play the presentation game successfully. Now, this is not a pure restoration. That kept their garage door, but it's still much more compatible with the character of the street and the district than the uh, way it was before. When you look at this whole set of buildings, you begin to see the impact um, that protection and regulation has had. Now, certainly, it was in a climate in which investment was occurring. But to some extent, the design review field, in fact, I know the design review system was providing a climate for investment. Uh, some of the buildings were too far gone. This little shop here had some had, had some mowing. Here it was at the time that we looked at it. And this owner basically fixed it up with a very simple paint scheme. We picked it at the bottom. This is all paint to emulate cornice line. And again, it's not even a cheap boutique necessarily. Well, by this time, uh, major investors were getting, getting to get attracted. <coughs> Heavily in the 
just uh, blocking off all of this area, creating some little courtyards down down the alleys in between buildings, creating a focal point here, and a special uh, box of trees in this area. And so, again, that black glass building that I mentioned to you earlier had sort of come to this, to this stage of the this And fences were exposed, molds were reconstructed, paint was removed chemically. You begin to see the street furniture coming in place. And by this time, the market got to the point where new construction was feasible. And so this corner lot, there's black glass around the corner here, and the firehouse is actually opposite us here. I received this new infill building. Now this is an example where I would call the pattern of contemporary. It's a very simple structure that is an abstraction of the historic buildings that sort of lets you know it's a new structure and serves as a background, a good neighbor to the historic buildings that are the real highlights of this building. Here's some of the details of contemporary buildings. About four contemporary buildings have been built now in the context of historic structures. And what's interesting is during the recession, Old Town did better in sales tax than the other commercial areas of town. And then some of the real jewels, finally, uh, were the last ones in the store. Now this is an example where preservation has made damn good economic sense. It helped start revitalization of downtown. What's exciting is to see not only is Old Town now coming along but the newer 1930s and 40s Main Street that had begun its decline is now a real hot spot. It's an active, active Main Street. You can go down there at night and there are cafes that are active, there are people on the street, there are lights and buildings upstairs where people are living. And it's a pretty exciting story. And a part of it, certainly not all of it, but a part of it is due to the design of the system of Now, there's one And in terms of experimenting with infill, I just want to show you a little bit of what's happening downtown Boulder with its advisory design system. This is our downtown area. We have the Nesbitt Mall on the old Main Street here. It's one of the few successful ones. The historic core is right in this area. This is sort of a transitional area. Uh, it, was, it was bombed out by urban renewal, and only a few people have ever built back in there. Um, the mall is, is successful. That's run from $20 to $40 a square foot. Pearl Street now. And the only way you get in there is to buy a lease. Um, so it's, it, it's sort of swimming upstream of the trend. Well, in the early 80s, this thing happened. And we call it the flying nun. And, uh, and everyone said, wait a minute. This is not what life is like it, about it. Old, the architect explained that he was establishing a new context for us. Uh, and the community said, thank you very much, and set up the guidelines for the new system instead. This was the next building built after the guidelines. It's a wraparound structure. It's this L-shaped building that goes around. They, re they renovated these historic properties as a part of the project. And here is one of the new buildings. And again, it's sort of a simplified abstraction of the traditional building elements. But enough of a tweak that uh, you know that it's a new construction. This is some of the detail here. The transit has been translated into a steel grill. Here. Around the corner, again, the banks were going to do the little damage. Uh, it was this one, which really was beyond, it wasn't one built by the firehouse. This sort of did a modest contemporary thing. Not a stunning piece of design, but a good compatible kind of thing to fill in the context of this one. Another building that by no means is historic and wasn't even a new one in case was the remodel of this building. If you look closely, this is actually just a concrete block structure that fits into the historic context as well. But it's really just seeing the new units. We have a 2 by 12 nailed up here to create the inlay of all the coordinated policy. Uh, this is an example of a historic building where the first floor had been totally bombed down. Certainly one option would have been to reconstruct it, but another option where the material is all missing, and particularly if information doesn't exist at all, it's all traditionally, is to do a contemporary interpretation. And that's what we have here. The storefront has been reinterpreted here that they this in brick. And there's a heavy steel detailing for the transom. It's a gusset, uh, heavy gusset and steel detail. But again, it evokes the tradition of the historic storefronts without just being another phony historic storefront. 
Some buildings require a little bit more. This is the newspaper. It's not a commercial building. It doesn't really need storefronts. We created some large display areas uh, so you can see the activity going on inside of the trip uh, rooms to respect the context of the street. Some got a little more playful. The review board didn't particularly like this one, but they did follow the basic building rules for design downtown Boulder. Make it a little popular. Uh, these are also new buildings. Massey was broken up to emulate traditional storefronts. Here you see it in its context. There are a couple of little star structures over here. Another new building for these. And then the building that uh, I really like is this structure. And I like it because it demonstrates that you can introduce new uses into a historic district. Uh, what you're looking at is a parking structure. Uh, this is, is a parking garage that holds over 200 cars. Uh, but it has a 20-foot deep ramp of retail and office all around the perimeter of uh, the public edges. And again, it respects the traditional storefront line and reflects the office uses in the upper story windows. What's also great about it is that it provided small shallow spaces for florists, dry cleaners, and shoe repair shops that were badly needed in them. And here the kickplate's been reinterpreted in steel and the awning in the glass. Here you can see the entrance into the parking. From a very design standpoint, it does some excellent things. The elevator is exposed at the corner. It's all glass so you can see who's waiting at the floors or the lower floors, so people feel comfortable using it at night time. It opens direct down to the street, not into the street lobby. And when you get around to the alley side, you see the business end of the building, and you see what it really is, or what it also is. <coughs> Last, in two minutes here, I just want to quickly show you a couple of projects that we're working on. Two neighborhoods, one in Fort Collins and one in Boulder, and these are not historic districts. They are, in effect, conservation districts. These are neighborhoods that want some form of design management, that don't want to be historic districts, or don't care to be historic districts, although we have some wonderful character to them. Um, they have a variety of housing, some of which are historic, and others of which aren't necessarily. But they've begun to see some disturbing trends, privacy fences. Hot tops. Um, it's a phenomenon uh, that we're seeing in the, on the front range extensively where smaller cottages are getting home in second floors or buildings such as this. So, Luke been involved, and it's upside down, and hey, I was wrong, Tony, I was wrong. <laughs> I didn't see that. Um, in a series of participatory workshops involving the neighborhood and helping to define the character of the area. And in this exercise, people sat around a table and used maps and photographs and note cards to describe the design features they liked and identify the issues they're concerned about their neighborhood. And it worked beautifully because a table of around eight to 10 people, there were invariably a couple of leaders who were marking on the map and they were making notes. But because there were photographs that you were allowed to write on and there were note cards that you could write on, each person, even the quiet person at the table, could make their comments and pin it onto the board be certain that it was all recorded and all reflect, reflected as a part of the process. And then, of course, the groups had to report their findings. They had to defend why they thought certain things were good about the meeting and why there were certain design issues. These have formed the basis of the development of the design policies for these neighborhoods. We've gone through a process of writing basically a white paper that describes the character of the neighborhood. It may be a freestanding document that could be a coffee table piece that you want to give to your neighborhood, or if your uncle, uncle Elmo is moving into the neighborhood and you want it to be sensitive to it, you can give him this citizen's guide to the Flatirons neighborhood. We develop sketches that help the citizens be able to report and talk about those characteristics that they find to be important in their building blocks. And we develop a series of scenarios that help them understand different policies that they might affect what a certain amount of square foot addition looks like versus one that goes out to the side versus up. 
taking the same amount of square footage. How does that feel? Because all too often, lay boards don't get the chance to see alternative designs as we do in design school, or how a much larger addition, a fourplex, might look in the context of that neighborhood. And this helps to develop policies that will be used in these neighborhoods. The other thing that we did was we asked them, how comfortable do you feel about certain design topics being regulated? And we asked them, in this case, about landscape and site design guidelines. And the majority said they should either be voluntary or advisory, required review of the voluntary compliance situation. They didn't feel comfortable regulating uh, design and landscape. Whereas when they were asked about regulation of new buildings, the vast majority said we want mandatory compliance. We feel very strongly that this is something that needs to be controlled. So we were beginning to fine tune the method in which design regulation will be used in these, in these neighborhoods. It's a different kind of an experience because in most cases, the debate to establish a historic district occurs before you write the guidelines. In these cases, the communities are seeking which design policy to use while the deciding if there even is any kind of district boundary at all. It may simply be that we will have voluntary guidelines that are distributed and there's no clear boundary for where they apply. Or on the other hand, there may be some form of design review. Another option we're actually uh, entertaining for Collins is simply very detailed amendments to the zoning code that will be administered by staff. There will be no board review. Um, all, but all of those are valid options that communities are exploring with these days uh, in the interest of trying to manage the, the character uh, of those neighborhoods. Now, obviously, this comes with a price. It comes with a concern that uh, we're limiting property rights or limiting creativity and design. But the fundamental thing in each of these communities that we're working in is, I think, an underlying strong belief that it is worth the price, that the long-term effect of the character of the community, of its livability, as well as its economy, is that this kind of management of character is essential if we're going to maintain animal communities in this, in this country and certainly attract people back to into some of these neighborhoods. Uh, the most telling book for that that I get is every two years I go back to Telluride to train the commission. It's essential to have regular training schedules uh, for commissions to get new members in and be refreshing. Uh, people just need a chance to step back and think. And I hold a work session with the development community. The city government and the commission are not allowed to attend. Uh, so it's developers and architects builders and realtors um, who come to this. And they always come and bitch about the design review system. And they complain about uh, the fact that the board appears to be arbitrary, the guidelines are too strict, and the guidelines are too vague. And every time I suggest, well, should we drop the system, they go, oh, no, 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 no. Because for them, they know that it makes money, that people buy and invest in Telluride because they know their investments they know that the character around them is what the character is going to be, by and large, 20 years from now, and that that is worth money to them. And they complain about the details of the operation of the system, but to a man, support the concept because they recognize that it's vital to them. Now, that's a resort economy, but I think it reflects in many respects underlying values that we all appreciate in our community. So, that's what Lauren should have. Um, but uh, I hope maybe this gives you some sort of an insight into the things that you deal with when you're fighting the trenches in a local uh, preservation planning kind of capacity. Uh, it's not necessarily preservation theory as purist. It's not necessarily uh, preservation as you discuss it in an abstract situation. But it's fun and it's exciting. It's fun to see communities such as this change and grow and see it work. And it, well, it's not perfect. There are buildings that are constructed in these districts that I didn't show you that aren't really successful. Uh, there are certainly horror stories where people did have a worse time than they should have been into the review process. But I think the results of Fort Collins have always speak for themselves. The result is that those are healthy, viable places to live. And so I think it's a tool that's worth 
most of our communities are considering something that they might add to their arsenal of planning tools. So, thanks a lot.